you believe not everybody likes to sing Amazing Grace. I'm going to prove it to you this morning. If you'll turn back again this morning to Luke chapter 15, verse 25 this time. We'll pick up where we were last week. I said we had a two-part series. When you're interim, you don't know. Two parts may be one part too long. But uh, here's a, a wonderful story. I reminded you last week that Jesus was telling uh, this to the tax collectors and sinners. Uh, and the Pharisees and scribes were listening and complaining about how Jesus welcomed sinners and eats with them. People just never did get it. They just didn't get why Jesus would come and spend so much time with lost people. And the Pharisees were especially could not understand that. So he told this part also for their sake in Luke 15 verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry, didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving for many years for you and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father, help us to find our place. Help us not to hear this parable just like it's some far distant story, but find ourselves here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if the story had ended in verse 24, you'd close your Bible and you'd try to picture the party, wouldn't you, as we did last week. Jesus says that going to heaven is the, one the, is, is the greatest party. So much joy in going to heaven. So many of his parables are about finding lost things and about celebrating Oh, I tell you what, I keep telling people, it's going to be great in heaven. People say, we're going to sit around on a cloud and play a harp. No, I can't play a harp. You probably can't either. But we're going to rejoice. Greatest joy you will ever know. It's, Jesus said it's, it's, it's just going to be a great time of celebration. Like this one in this story that I told you last week. But, but I, you know, I, if it stopped at verse 24, I'd close my Bible, I'd try to picture the party. How many slices of roast beef did the prodigal son eat till he was full? Or how many steaks, and what's his favorite steak? Is it the sirloin, is it the porterhouse? T-bone, what's, what's your favorite steak? I wonder how many of those that the prodigal son ate because he had been starving to death for so long. How long did the music and the dancing go on the orchestra play. How long before they formed the conga line, you know, and Stan began to dance out the door and everybody said, great, let's clean this place up and go to bed. How long did the party go on? Remember Jesus' audience as I pointed out to you again and again in verses one and two. Verse 24 left the Pharisees and scribes puzzled, angry, and in disbelief. It can't end like this. No, 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 no. It cannot end like this. And it didn't. Jesus went on to verse 25. We should have known that from verse 11 where Jesus said there were a certain man had two sons. We should have known the second part was coming. So far, no mention of this older son. So when Jesus began the second part of the story, the Pharisees probably relaxed and said, ah, okay. All this silly partying, all this rejoicing over some trashy son who's come home. 
Oh, this is over now. This uh, second son's going to stop all this. Oh, yes, the older brother will stop all this partying nonsense. Finally, someone with a little sense shows up. You see, the grace and forgiveness of the father was a little too amazing for this other son. Just too amazing. The Pharisees were not gathering around the flute players and singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like this prodigal son, like this boy. They, didn't, they wouldn't do that. Did you sing it a while ago? I hope you sang it. I'm sure, like most congregations, some sang, some didn't. I cannot imagine, though, not singing Amazing Grace. Can you? You know it's the Baptist National Anthem, right? That's what we sing. That's what we believe. And yet the words stick in some people's throats. Maybe they feel too sinful themselves and they cannot forgive themselves. They've heard that God will forgive them, but they can't forgive themselves. I've known people like that and tried to convince them. If you confess with your mouth, if you confess your sins with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's just so hard to get everybody to believe that though. No, you don't know what I did. You don't know about, about my life. If you're here today and you feel like that, you need to read the words of amazing grace one more time. Amazing grace. Maybe some people say I can't believe in amazing grace because it talks about wretches. It saved a wretch like me. Well, I'm not a wretch. That's not a politically correct term, is it? Who's a wretch? Well, I am. And Jesus saved a wretch like me. And I got news for you. I know some other wretches too. Don't you? But some people say, I, I, I would never qualify. I'm, I'm a good person. I've worked my way on right on up the line and I'm gonna get, just get off the top step of the ladder and step right into heaven one of these days. Oh, no, you're not. It doesn't work that way. It's by amazing grace. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. You haven't done anything to deserve heaven. And maybe some people are thinking about somebody who hurt them, somebody who molested them, somebody who abused them, somebody who cheated on them. And maybe sometimes we don't want to think that God might forgive that person. We're holding that grudge and we're probably going to die with that grudge and think, I just cannot believe that God would save that person. John's mother died when he was seven. At age 11, after being in a boarding school for a while, he begged his father, his father who was in the Navy, captain of a ship in the British Navy, begged his father, let me go to, let me go to sea with you. I'm sick and tired of school. I want to go to sea. And so... His father finally agreed to take him to sea at age 11. He said that by the time he was 17, he had, he had committed every sin that he'd ever heard of. By the age of 17, he joined the British Navy. He sailed the coast of Africa. He d decided he'd had enough of the Navy for a while, and he, so he jumped ship and he deserted, but he was captured and beaten and put in irons and hauled around for a while. And after his release, he... He became a, a, a captain himself. He got his own ship. And he was a slaver. And he captured people. And, and then he was captured and made a slave himself. But somehow he escaped and got back to the sea and caught a ship and headed back to England. And on the way he picked up a copy of a book called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. And after having read that book, he gave his heart to Christ. For the next 16 years, John studied and became a pastor. He often preached in a sailor suit. He had, a, had his pulpit in his church shaped like the bow of a ship. He would talk about the adventures at sea and 
And he wrote lots of poems and lots of songs. And one day he sat down and wrote this song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. That's John Newton's story, you see. The story of amazing grace. You and I ought always to sing Amazing Grace. It's how we were saved, Amazing Grace. It gives hope to the hopeless. It glorifies God. It helps us to understand why Jesus had to die on the cross. It's a great song. Well, back to the story now. Where had the older brother been? He missed the younger brother's arrival. He missed his father's 100-yard dash down the road to meet his brother. He missed the party preparations, the setup, all that stuff. You know where he was? He was out in the fields because he was a hard-working man. Out in the fields, an overseer. Many servants, many duties, working from sunup to sundown, working himself. Unlike his prodigal brother that he must have thought about sometime and wondered what he's doing. He wasn't wasting his time in his youth. He was a hard-working man trying to please his father and to get what he could out of him. He was just like the Pharisees who spent years and years learning and working and uh, avoiding sin when they could and observing all the rules. And the older brother was like that. He was doing what needed to keep the farm going, you see. So like any responsible son, he was out there working so hard in the field that day. I know daddy's going to be so proud. About sunset, probably he arrived at home, a long trudge back up the hill to the house, bone weary, dusty, hungry. In the distance he could see smoke. Sooner or later he got the whiff of the air. Hmm, something's cooking. Something's on the grill. We're having something on the grill tonight. I wonder what's going on. Then as he got closer, he began to hear music and people laughing and flutes and drums and horns and what in the world is going on? And when he got close to the house, he saw crowds of happy people, smiles everywhere. Women had made a big circle out there and the men were dancing those Jewish dances that they do out there. Everybody was happy except the fattened calf, I'm sure. Women were clapping time. Men were dancing. People were laughing. One of the household servants came by. Hey, what's going on over there? Looks like a 4th of July cookout or something. What's, what's happened up there? Somebody's birthday? Some holiday that I've forgotten about? The servant blurted out the good news. Your brother who's been gone so long came home today and your daddy's so happy that he's throwing the biggest party any of us have ever seen. He's even killed the fattened calf, that one that was kept for that very special day and very special celebration. How did the older brother react to this news? Oh, don't you just think he shouted, my little brother is home. Oh, hallelujah, we thought he was dead and gone. Mom and daddy must be so happy. Thank God for answered prayers and I can't wait to see my little brother and hug him. Uh, no, didn't go down like that. The older brother got mad. He was sold up. He went away to be alone with his anger. I figure he went around behind the barn somewhere, you know. Remember when the younger brother was lying in the hog pen and came to himself and said, I perish with hunger? The older brother could now say, I perish with anger. I'm so mad I could, I don't know what. He could not imagine that his insane father would throw a party for a worthless bum who had wasted his inheritance as he partied in the far country. His father must be getting senile, he probably thought. The old man's lost his marbles. You can't make a party for something like that. That's exactly what the Pharisees were thinking. <laughs> you can't have a party like this. You can't do like this. This boy has wasted his inheritance. And so he refuses to be a part of this nonsense. He did not believe in the unmerited favor of his father. Unmerited favor is the way you describe grace. Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, that's what it means. 
Grace is something you don't deserve. You don't earn so much and work so hard and spend so much time at work. And then God says, all right, that's what I've been looking for, a hard worker. It's unmerited. You don't deserve it. None of us and all of us in here put together do not deserve one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ, folks. It's unmerited. The unmerited favor of God. Well, the father came out looking for him. Where's my son? He, the other boy ought to be home by now. It's getting, it's, the sun is going down. He should be back here. Uh, anybody seen my other son? Some servant said, yeah, he's over there behind the barn whining. What? So he went outside and found him. Come on inside, son. The party's going. Your brother is back. But he lit into his father. Did you see that? Oh, my goodness. Verse 29, that's some strong language right there. And the Pharisees must have been smiling with glee about all this. <laughs> Finally, somebody arrives who's got a little sense. It's going to put an end to all this insanity. Look how the son addresses his father in verse 29. Look, you. That was totally disrespectful to use to your father. Look. Let me explain a few things to you, old man. Disrespect. All these years I've been slaving for you. I, I've worked so hard. I've been loyal. I've served you out of duty. Not out of love, but out of duty. Trying to impress you. You see, he was obviously in it for what he could get. You never even gave me and my friends a goat to barbecue, much less the fattened calf. A goat was worth one-tenth of a cow in those days, by the way. You didn't kill the fattened calf for me and for my friends. You didn't. You hadn't even given us a goat to barbecue. I've been, I've been with you all these years and the, and the father's thinking, yeah, you've been sitting at my table all these years eating everything that I eat. And then he says something else. This son of yours, notice he didn't say my brother. Did you get that? This son of yours, he, he, he cuts, off, cuts off relationships with him. I don't want anything to do with him. The son of yours spent all your money on, uh, on prostitutes and wild living. So we have no relationship. I have nothing to do with it. The Pharisees must have been seeing that and saying, yeah, that's right. All these sinners up there listening to Jesus. I don't have any relationship with those people. Altogether, this brother was angry and unforgiving. And his remarks tell us that he is ungracious and he is self-righteous. I've slaved all these years. He is loveless. He is hard-hearted. Huh. Pretty good description of the Pharisees who were listening to this story and kind of seething under the collar. You see, none of them wanted anything to do with amazing grace. They're not going to ever gather around the piano and while someone plays the song, they're not going to sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They're certainly not going to think about when we've been there 10,000 years and all of us together. What? Are you kidding me? I'm not going to be there with those people. The older son thought there should be no forgiveness for some sins. How about you? Are there some sins that you say, well, I just can't forgive that. I'm just not going to forgive it. His brother did not deserve forgiveness. That's right. I don't deserve forgiveness and you don't deserve forgiveness. That's why it's called grace. Amazing stuff, isn't it? Amazing. The father tries to reason with him eight times in the parable. He says, son, my child, and he's, he's holding this relationship out. Son, everything I have is yours. You know that. You're here with me always, and, and everything I have is yours, son. But your brother was dead to us. 
He was dead in sin, and now he is alive. He is lost, but he is now found. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Don't you understand, son? We had to have a party and rejoice that your brother is back. We had to do this. He's back. Don't you understand? Notice the last words of the parable. He was lost and is found. And with that, Jesus cuts the parable off. Whoop, 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 Jesus, wait a minute here. You can't let it in like that. <laughs> you got to resolve the tension in a good story, you know. You, you can't leave us with this. You can't leave us hanging like this, Jesus. What happens next? You see, you get to write your own ending to the story. It's your story. It's my story. Whether or not I'm going to receive amazing grace or sing about amazing grace or not, it's up to you. It's your story. I wonder if the boy hung his head and said, Dad, you're right. I'm so glad my brother is home. Or did he pick up a rock and smash his daddy in the head saying you're too dumb to live? They crucified Jesus. And what he offered was amazing grace and they crucified Jesus. What did this boy do to his daddy? I don't know. Did he sulk the rest of his days and refuse to speak to his brother? Was he full of hatred and anger? Did he get an ulcer? If you lived in a house and found that it was rat infested and you went to the store and you said, I need to get rid of the rats and they said, here's a bottle of rat poison go pour this out and the rats will eat it and they'll die. And suppose you took it home and you drank the rat poison hoping the rats would die. That's kind of what this story talks about. Unforgiveness will kill you. It is bad stuff for you. Did some Pharisee though, having heard this story, jump up with a shout of recognition, I get it now, I'm I'm the elder brother. And maybe another one and, and maybe somebody else. I know some of the Pharisees began to follow Jesus. Who jumped up and said, it's me. He's talking about me. How many of them got the point of the story? Wow. I don't know whether that happened or not. Maybe not. Because in a little while they're going to go crucify Jesus. The story reminds us that there are two kinds of prodigals, folks. Those who go wild and rebel against the Heavenly Father and some of them come to themselves and come back in repentance like we took that last week and come back home and some don't. And then there are those who stay home but reject the values and the grace of the Father. They seethe with anger. They resent the Father. They don't serve God in love. They serve him with some kind of duty, some kind of idea that I'm going to impress God. Maybe there's a little bit of both of those in us. I don't know. What do you think? What do you see inside of you? Where do you identify in this story, this great parable? Are you in there? Where are you in this story? Do you sing amazing grace? Do you receive amazing grace? If today you're like that boy we talked about last week and you've gone away from God and you say it's time to come home, I've come to myself and I'm coming back to God, then receive amazing grace. And if there's somebody somewhere that you just can't forgive and you just... I don't want to go to heaven with them. You need to sing Amazing Grace and learn about the forgiveness and the unmerited favor of the Heavenly Father. Do you find yourself here anywhere? If so, this time is for you. This invitation time is your time to receive Amazing Grace. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe you've decided this is it. I want to come and unite with this church. Maybe you need some profession of faith. 
Uh, it's some visible sign. Maybe you need to come and ask for baptism. Maybe that, then that's your time right now. But we want to invite you now to stand and as we sing, you come on if God's Spirit is leading you. Come on.